We want to thank the organizers of the conference for accepting our proposal, even if we were rather late in submitting it. Let me first introduce myself and my co-author. I'm a self-employed archaeologist from Vienna and my research focuses on mining and metallurgy. In the past I have done research projects on medieval and early modern times gold mining in the Austrian Alps, on Roman iron production in Carinthia and southern Austria, the famous Nordic steel, and on sandstone quarrying in Meroe in northern Sudan, in Africa. Currently I am project manager of a four-year interdisciplinary project on a Roman gold mine situated about 70 kilometers to the south of Vienna. This is the only Roman gold mine known in the Eastern Alps. The project is financed by the Austrian Science Fund. Reconstructing the gold washing method described by Pliny the Elder is the first archaeological experiment I've ever done. Heimer Urban, my co-author, is a very proficient gold panner. He won world championship in 2018 and there is absolutely nothing about gold washing or gold panning that he doesn't know. Without his cooperation, it would not have been possible to conduct this experiment successfully. Before we come to the actual experiment, I want to briefly introduce the project. I was lucky to be able to interest colleagues from various scientific disciplines to join us. Apart from archaeology, the research encompasses survey and cartography, Roman history, geology, analysis of gold, geophysics, hydraulic engineering and pollen analysis. Three local friends helped us with mapping the leads and my co-author taught us all about panning gold for analysis and for fun, of course. And we also have a professional documentary filmer in the team who is working on a TV documentary about Roman gold. And the deposit that was mined by the Romans is a placer deposit consisting of clay and sand and sandy gravel in which tiny flakes of gold are randomly distributed. The picture to the right shows the largest gold pieces found so far in the cart. The one to the left weighs about a quarter of a gram. The picture to the left shows the normal sizes of the gold flakes found in the car. The majority of them is about a tenth of a millimeter. As it is a placer deposit with the gold randomly distributed, mining with galleries and shafts is not possible. The Romans, being brilliant hydraulic engineers, invented a method to mine placer deposits using the power of water. The picture shows you the most famous Roman hydraulic gold mine, Las Medulas, in northwestern Spain. Pliny the Elder was procurator of Hispania Taraconensis in the year 73 AD. As such, he was also responsible for the gold mines in northwestern Spain. In the 33rd book of his natural history, he describes the principle of hydraulic mining from first-hand experience. This slide shows a reconstruction of hydraulic mining. Water was collected in aqueducts. In mining context, they are called leads. The water was stored in large tanks on top of the deposit. As the deposit of Las Medulas consists of hard conglomerate, galleries and shafts were dug. Then the sluice gates were opened, the water flowed through the galleries and shafts and eroded the deposit. The resulting sediment was transported by the water to the washing areas. This slide shows a map of the mining area in the cart, which is the local name of the landscape where the mines are situated. All in all we have 10 individual mining areas, which are marked with A on the map, with more than 20 tanks. The water was brought to the mining areas by five leads. Lead 2, the longest lead, is about 63 kilometers long. All in all we have about 122 kilometers of leads. The mining area itself and the catchment areas of the leads cover an area of about 70 square kilometers. The leads are open channels, as can be seen from this well-preserved section of a lead. Due to the fact that there was no agricultural activity in the mining areas after the Romans left, for centuries it has just been forest. The tanks are very well preserved too. The embankments are still standing to their original height. Each tank has one inlet for the lead and at least one outlet leading to the mine. Here you can see what the actual mines look like. They are characterized by steep slopes and deep ravines, all the result of Roman gold mining. Pliny the Elder not only describes the mining itself, but also how to obtain the gold by washing the sediment. Pliny writes, Trenches are excavated for the water to flow through, which descend by steps. The floor is covered with heather, it's ulex in Latin, a plant resembling rosemary, which is rough and holds back the gold. The sides of the trenches are lined with wooden planks. 
This is necessary to prevent the erosion of the sides of the channel. If the natural ground consists of rock or clay, it's not necessary to seal it with wooden planks. If the natural ground, however, consists of gravel or loose soil, covering it with wood is essential. The sediment is swept through these trenches by water. Due to its high density, the gold is caught in the header. Uh, Pliny then continues. The header is dried and burned, and its ashes are washed over a bed of tight grass so that the gold is deposited in it. In some mining areas of the cart, we have evidence of the trenches described by Pliny, but it is also clear that movable wooden sluice boxes were used. As it was impossible to dig a channel as described by Pliny, we decided to build a wooden sluice box instead. And as the aim of the experiment was not reenactment, but to verify Pliny's description and to add the finer details that he left out, we did not use traditional carpentry techniques to build our sluice box. For the size of it, however, we used Roman units of measurements. It had a length of 10 Roman feet, which is about 3 meters, and a width of 1 Roman foot, which is about 30 centimeters. To facilitate construction, we built it in two separate halves, which were then put together, and the joint was reinforced with more planks. In order to understand our reconstruction, it is necessary to talk briefly about modern sluice boxes and how they work. They consist of metal and their floor is covered by a rough mat called minus moss. This is fixed by a coarse meshed metal grid and metal riffles. The grid and the riffles create turbulences, which facilitate the separation of gold from sand and gravel. Heavy minerals, the so-called black sand and gold, accumulates in the grid, along the riffles and in the mat. Without the grid, the riffles and the mat, the friction at the floor of the sluice box would not be strong enough to prevent the gold and the heavy minerals from being swept away by the current of the water. As the properties of gold and the mechanisms of how it is trapped in a sluice box are basic facts, our Roman sluice box had to be constructed following the same principles as a modern one. The top half was reserved for the water supply and feeding it with sediment. A small movable plank served as a core separator for the larger stones. In the bottom half, three small wooden planks were screwed to the floor of the sluice box. They are the equivalent of riffles on a modern sluice box. And the header is the minus moss. The students are building one half of the sluice box. As said before, we used modern tools. Here is our finished sluice box. The next step was collecting heather in the forest. Heather, Coluna vulgaris, is a native plant not only in the cart but also in other parts of Europe. It is also very abundant in the region of Las Medulas. Bunches of heather, which is the equivalent of the modern minus moss, were bent in a U shape and put on top of the riffles with the U pointing upwards, meaning against the current of the water. This arrangement ensures an even flow of water and sediment. At last the header was fixed by wooden branches and sticks to prevent it being swept away by the water. The finished sluice box was then installed in one of the brooks that ran out of the deposit. From our previous gold panning activities we knew that the sediment of this brook contains gold. The sluice box was set up at an angle of 12 degrees. As the water flow of the brook was very small, and the downward gradient of the brook was also very small, we decided to use two pumps powered by a generator to ensure a constant water supply. The next step was hard work, namely digging the sediment of the brook and shoveling it into buckets of a volume of 12 liters. The buckets were then emptied into the feeding area of the sluice box. The coarse separator prevented larger stone from being swept across the header. They were immediately removed by hand. For a successful operation, it was necessary to keep the sediment in constant flow and to remove all the stones. This was done by our washerwomen. As the main aim of the experiment was to test the efficiency of gold washing with header as minus moss, we installed a modern sluice box at the bottom of our reconstructed one. Any gold not trapped in the header would not be able to escape the modern sluice box. The picture to the right shows the header already partially saturated with sediment, containing heavy minerals and gold. To our great joy, washing the sediment from the sluice box in a pan showed that not even the tiniest gold flake had escaped the header. 
After feeding about 40 buckets of sediment into the sluice box, the header was saturated and had to be changed. As the saturated header was much harder to the touch than header that could still absorb sediment, it was easy to judge the right moment for changing it. On the first day of gold washing, we put the saturated header into buckets, ready for drying and burning. The sluice box was then lined with fresh header. As the small leaves and branches of the header were still intact and pliable, we decided on the second day of gold washing to reuse it, so we just rinsed it in a bucket with water and put it back in the sluice box. Any gold still trapped in the header stayed there. This was a valuable insight. The header is abundant in the cart, but if the Romans would have changed it every time it was saturated, they would soon have run out of header. We are certain that they recycled it the same way as we did. The next step was laying out the header to dry. Before we laid it out to dry, we rinsed it again and pre-washed the sediment in a modern sluice box in order to reduce the amount of sediment that had to be washed in a pan. We are pretty sure that the Romans did the same. They probably fed the sediment of the first washing cycle again into a sluice box to reduce the amount of sand. It can be assumed that they repeated this until a nice concentrate of black sand was achieved that then had to be washed in a pan. It makes no sense to also throw the sediment that falls out of the header when you handle it into the fire together with the header. The header was then burned as described by Pliny. Also the header was not quite dry, it burned very well due to its essential oils. While the header was burning, we washed the gold pairing sediment in a pan. In the space of one hour and 30 minutes, the header was reduced to fine ash, which was then put into a bucket with water. As the amount of ashes was relatively small, we skipped the washing over a tight bed of grass. Gold gets trapped in a tight bed of grass, the ashes get swept away, and all you have to do is shake the grass and the gold falls out. We, however, wash the ashes in a pan. Apart from being a lot of fun, the experiment yielded valuable insights into Roman gold washing. First of all, we were able to prove the accuracy of Pliny's description. But as he describes only the basic mechanisms, the experiment enabled us to reconstruct the finer details, which are essential for gold washing in a sluice box, like the riffles and the way in which the header has to be put into the sluice box and fixed. Movable sluice boxes were probably not much larger than the one we built. A 3 meter long wooden sluice box can be carried by two men, even when the wood is saturated with water, and it can be set up easily in also in difficult terrain. Further insights were that the header can be reused numerable times, and the fact that the Romans must have used multiple washing cycles to get rid of most of the sandy particles and to obtain a high concentrate of black sand before the final panning. Due to its essential oils, header burns easily and is reduced to a fine ash. And best of all, header is extremely efficient as minus moss. No gold whatsoever was found in the modern sluice box. This showed us that as in many other areas, the Romans were highly efficient in what they did. Finally, we want to thank the students for their enthusiastic participation in the experiment and local friends for lending us the generator and the pumps. The reconstructed sluice box has been given to the museum in Neunkirchen, which was the Roman town nearest to the gold mine. In the course of this spring, we will set it up as a museum piece together with panels describing the gold mine and the Roman method of gold washing. Thank you all for your kind attention and please do not forget to check out our website for any news.